So they're changing stuff around. Not really sure if this is even going to be going live yet. So it says here that I've been live for 10 seconds. I don't know if you guys can see yet. Oh, there we go. All right, so Kyle just said it just started. Yeah, it took a little while to get this thing going. It's kind of weird. A little weird, I have to admit. So guys, welcome to the September Title Gardens live show. Uh, I can never tell because YouTube is always changing little things in the back end. <clears throat> and the YouTube creators, for the most part, you guys are aware of what's, what this all looks like. There is a, a beta thing in, that goes on. Um, it's a, like a studio beta that they're trying to move everybody over to. And the last thing that they're really tweaking and toying with is the live show stuff. And I can never tell exactly if what I'm trying to do ever really works. So, looks like it does. Um, welcome, everybody. Welcome. We are about three minutes away from the actual start of the coral sales. But I wanted to say to say my highs and hellos to you guys. To please, already with the $1.99. Thank you so much, man. Thank you, thank you. Let's see, Mike Shepherds from the Bronx, welcome. Marcus Aurelius, refresh worked, good. Yeah, I tried the refresh early, but maybe it was just that within that little taped delay, so it didn't quite work out for me. Jessica J, hello, welcome. Uh, received notification, clicked on it right away, awesome, glad. There was one time where the notification system just didn't go out and it was definitely noticeable in the amount of traffic that we got. I think that I had a guest on and we were both, it was, it was probably Rico actually, we we're just like looking at these numbers and like none of these numbers look right. This is like a third of what I normally get for whatever reason. So I did that whole live show and I said, you know, I'm gonna try this again tomorrow to see if they fix their notification thing. Didn't fix it yet. It was still like super low viewership. But then like the next week they fixed it. And again, it's like triple the numbers. So yeah, those notifications, those are a big deal. Dwayne Clark, first time. Awesome, glad to have you. Uh, Acro Breeder on the market for Zoas. Well, you're, you're in luck, Acro Breeder, because uh, the first part of the live show is gonna be mostly Zoas. And then there's gonna be some Zoas spread out here and there. Now the problem with Zoas and this particular live show is that oftentimes just physically taking one from our rack, putting it into place for shooting, it just annoys them. And they don't wanna open when it comes time for me to, to take the video of them. So a few of them are, are kind of closed up. <clears throat> and so I have to excuse my voice. There was a little bit of carpentry that was going on and I've cleaned this place up insanely since uh, since the workers left, but uh, there's still a little bit of dust in the air or something, and it always gets to my throat. Uh, fishing. Oh, you know what? It's time to go. So let's do this. Uh, let's do this live show thing. It's 2 p.m. my time. Here we go. <clears throat> so okay. So as promised, here's some zoas. And like I said, a couple of them were gonna be closed. I was gonna wait for them to open, but trust me, they they normally look pretty good. Uh, let's see, somebody, I wanted to, to react to somebody that had mentioned, oh, asking about the new building. The new building is coming along slowly. I do plan on doing an update video, but I wanted more like usual, I want more stuff to get done before I start doing an update video. 
There are, I don't think that there's a single part of this whole process that isn't delayed to some degree. Luckily, a lot of it is going to be coming together, but everything is delayed. I mean, even down to just me purchasing uh, equipment from a wholesaler, like uh, uh, my protein skimmer, for example, uh, from Coral View, the reef octopus skimmers. Apparently, nobody buys my model of skimmer. So we had to wait until the shipment came from China. And that took, I think, like an extra month and a half or so. So finally, they're in the process of sending me my skimmers that I paid for six weeks ago. Um, I've been waiting on calcium reactors for a super long time. I've been waiting on plumbing for a super long time. Uh, it was kind of funny. One of the, the plumbers showed up a couple days ago. And, you know, Ben and I are all excited. We're like, sweet, the plumber's finally here. They came to pick up something for another job. So, like, the, the guy came and was like, I'm so sorry, but I'm just here to pick something up and, we, and I have to go. And he's like, yeah, I talked to Jeremy and I was like, I don't know what to tell Than if he happens to come out when I'm here getting, my, getting the stuff. So, anyway, I, I, I did ask him about, you know, when the next time they're going to be able to come over was. And it looks like possibly next week they can start plumbing these tanks so we shall see Dwayne Clark thank you so much for the for the two dollar super chat by the way any and all super chats are highly welcome and encouraged at this point so I had to pay um, several thousand dollars more to redo a whole bunch of stuff with the electrical here this is kind of like a, a long and silly story but um, all these outlets in the ceilings and everything like for, for lighting should have been uh, 20 amp, in individual 20 amp breakers for every single set of outlets. That was not the case. Not only was that not the case, but we need to run another dozen or so separate circuits for lighting. And yep, we just cut open the ceiling, started running all these wires, and we practically ran out of space in the in the breaker box there's so many circuits that we had to like completely redesign that entire thing just to accommodate all the additional circuits and you know in, in several of the things you know required like um like three slots in there because they're like three phase um you know 40 amp breakers 30 or 40 amp breakers for like big air conditioners and stuff like that so yeah, it's been it's been a little bit of a, a thing lately. So, but I can I can safely say that once this little phase is over, ele electrical wise, we're gonna be in good shape. And in the grand scheme of things, it's not the end of the world. But I'm just glad that we're getting it done now, so that I'm not cutting into my ceiling um, once there's water flowing downstairs. <clears throat> That's like you paid to have it fixed. Oh yeah, by the way, dollar ninety nine. Appreciate it too, please. Yeah, I had to pay to get it fixed because, under no circumstances, are the original electricians allowed back here ever. They, I mean, they're the ones who screwed it up so royally in the first place. So, it's one of those things where like electricians sometimes, and I'm not saying all electricians. I'm saying definitely my electricians. But they don't like pay attention when you say sub something along the lines of, I need a ton of power for all these LED lights that I'm going to be putting in. Because in residential life, LED lights, you can run an entire house full of LED lights off of one circuit. So they just don't believe me that I need like 22 separate circuits for LED lighting. And because, you know, in their head, LED lights equals basically free electric. They're so energy efficient. I'm like, no, those are not my LED lights. My LED lights have something like 40 individual five watt LEDs in them, trying to like replicate the freaking sun at the equator for stuff that's 20 feet underwater, 20 to 50 feet underwater. That's, that's how bright I need it. They don't listen to that. So what I ended up getting was definitely not enough um, power output coming from the outlets in my ceiling. So we literally ran, we meaning somebody that's not me, I just cut the check. Uh, we literally ran something like 
probably like 22 to 24 separate circuits just for lighting. Yeah. <clears throat> Okay, so anyway, that's my little story lately. Uh, Xbox 360 service from Ireland. Wow, nice. Harkins Aquatics. I did then. I finally became because a Patreon. I missed it. Say that again. Say that again, Harkins. Deacanthus, bunch of hot messes, LOL. Yeah. See, guys, I haven't even told you like the most insane story about this whole thing. Like the, the, the reason I can be so calm about this is because this like whole issue with, with electric is like a four on my, on my scale of total nonsense I've had to deal with when building this thing. So for example, uh, we had to put in a septic tank because we, we don't have access to city sewer first of all like city sewer does not come even onto this street so all these houses all these businesses and everything like that have to run off of septic tanks um, we had to install a new septic tank entirely because the the one for my farmhouse is like 500 feet away it'll never work so this building gets its own septic system well that particular um, installer is orders of magnitude worse than the electrician guy. And by the way, I'm sorry, if you guys have questions about like reef aquarium stuff, I'm sorry, I'm gonna be missing them all for like a good little while while I tell these stories. I apologize in advance. So anyway, the septic guy, first of all, was probably in some kind of hot water or trouble or something because he was leaving his equipment on site here for months at a time. So if you can imagine a small place leaving hundreds of thousands of dollars of excavation equipment on a work site and going away for six months at a time. It's very, very bizarre behavior, unless you're trying to hide that from like a bankruptcy repossession situation, or you may have stolen those, <laughs> those excavators to begin with, and you're just like stashing it illegally on my property, whatever the case might be. That's not the big problem with that guy though. So we're finally at the point where the septic system is here, all the inspections are going just fine, and there's only two things that need to be done left. One is a pressure test, which from what I understand takes about five minutes. The next thing that needs to be done is just the final paperwork that says, here was the original design that was approved, here is what we delivered, check, check, sign it off, and this thing gets approved, okay? This guy vanishes, he's gone. So I can't get in touch with this guy. The county that did the permitting can't get in touch with this guy. So because uh, this guy is just basically vanished off the face of the earth, um, I can never get my thing approved. And I'm like, well, can I just hire somebody else? to do this and we can just get this thing approved and I can't because the original permit for this work was tied to that contractor and that contractor has to be the one to do it all. So I literally can't have anybody else do this or if I do have somebody else do this, that other contractor, the one that's gone, um, he still has to be the person to sign it off on the whole thing. Like. What the hell? Like what a dumb, dumb, dumb system. So long story short, I have this septic system that I can use. It's in this like gray area limbo, but I can, for example, never sell this property. I don't plan to sell this property, but not having the ability to sell the property and not wanting to sell the property, two very different things, right? So anyway, that is on my like eight or nine level of ridiculous nonsense that, tied to this property so yeah that guy definitely needs to get sued it's just like I got other things working right now I don't really have the time or attention span to be suing somebody right now but yeah that guy definitely needs to get sued if you ever I don't even know if the guy's still alive I've got no idea like no one can get in touch with him no clue I don't know maybe I don't know Maybe they John Gotti'd him, who knows. 
All right, let's talk about some corals. <laughs> Harkins Aquatics became a Patreon. Okay, gotcha. Thank you. I appreciate it, man. I really do. Dwayne Clark hoping to get hooked up with some Favias. We definitely went a little heavier on the Favias. We had some Montipora that were looking a little under the weather for some reason. So we shifted uh, a lot of our selection towards more of the things like Favias and stuff like that. So you should be able to see some stuff. Yeah, it's certainly been quite the rodeo. You know, it's 100% uh, it's worth it. But at the same time, it's just like, how are you people in business? A lot of them, like a lot of them, like how on earth are you guys still in business? And sometimes the answer to that is they're not in business. <laughs> I don't know how that exactly helps me, but yeah, yeah. And that is a broken system because I think technically because uh, they're they're bonded, you know, but by by the by taking out a permit, you're bonded, meaning that like not me, I'm, I'm not bonded, but the contractor and the and the county is bonded so it's like technically the county's responsibility to make sure that guy gets his stuff done it's supposed to be like consumer protection right well i'm the consumer that's totally getting screwed here and worse yet i'm now having a hard time getting in touch with the county like the person i need to need to, to contact about all this is ducking me anyway yeah it's at, at some point i'm gonna get a legal team on that <sighs> Weird, what if the contract, exactly, like Stan Andreessen. Uh, weird, what if the contractor is dead? I would like to actually have that discussion with the person at the county, if that person at the county would respond to my voicemails. Because yeah, it's exactly like, so here, here's another dumb thing. What if this is like, oh, you okay, like how dumb would this be if I need to dig up this septic tank, lift it up out of the ground, put it back in the ground and have, you know, I'm just like thinking of like all the dumb ways to get around this bureaucracy. Like the, the, the fact that, you know what, cut it out, like cut the actual septic tank out, crane it out of the ground, start from scratch, put it back in the ground, fill it back in and let's, let's go from here. Like that is the stuff that's on the table in my head because of like literally a five minute test and paperwork. Anyway, yeah. Uh, yeah, two please. How can you be stuck like that? That's crazy. Again, appreciate all the dollar ninety nines. Uh, and uh, reef safe epoxy. I don't even use epoxy. I. I, all that is stuff is pretty much the same, but all that stuff is kind of like a little weird. I don't like the, the oils and stuff like that that are going on in it. In it. I tend to use a lot of super glue whenever possible. Uh, but any of those marine epoxies are pretty similar. Um, I've used the, the D the D and D stuff. Um, I've also used like a Julian Sprung's stuff. If, I don't know what the, the brand name is. Uh, let's see, Alfredo, thanks for the suggesting getting a uh, 12 to 35 Panasonic for the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema 4K. It's a perfect lens for shooting the tank. Uh, 18 to 35. Yeah, 18 to 35. Um, oh, no, 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 no. You're right. You're right. My bad. Uh, 12 to 35. Yeah. I, I was thinking about something completely different. My bad. Yeah. No, that that's a really good lens for that. Harkins, would you consider Samacora a fast grower? Um, I would. Now, there are certain varieties of Samacora that definitely grow faster than others. So we've got this uh, this green variety. I think uh, it's called like a John Deere because it, it has like yellow eyes, but most of it's green. And that one grows fairly quickly. But there's an all green one that um, grows like three times faster. And then there is uh, a couple of others uh, of types of Samacora that are like really, really cool and they're like slower growing. So unfortunately, like the most common looking ones grow the quickest, the most 
desirable, like super colorful morphs tend to grow more slowly, at least for us. Uh, but most of them are kind of middle of the road, and I would say that they grow about as fast as an encrusting Montipora. So if two please, if you're looking to uh, get, just to get stuff down to encrust, um, I would almost try to glue it down on a dry substrate with super glue. Um, usually the only time that I would personally go with a lot of the reef epoxies and stuff like that is if you needed to work underwater and f to like attach larger pieces of, of rock work together, if that makes sense. Craig Hogg, watching from Scotland. Love the info. Uh, love the info I can get. Keep up the great work. Thank you. Thank you. So I didn't announce this ever before, but I'm actually going to be in the UK. So in, uh, let's see, let me pull up my calendar here. I am going to be there in October from basically the 12th through the 17th. So there's a couple of different trade shows going on in the London area. Uh, I don't know what they're called. Uh, I'm visiting a, uh, a consulting client. <clears throat> and uh, so if you guys know Eco Marines, I'm going to be visiting uh, her and her business. And there's two trade shows that she's going to be attending. Uh, I wish I could tell you either of the names of those trade shows. But uh, yeah, I will be visiting up there. Maybe at some point we can do a meet and greet or something like that. Probably should be doing it at these trade shows because that would be the most convenient thing. But yeah, I'll be up there. I haven't been to the, to uh, to any place in Europe since I was about like sixteen, so I'm I'm kind of looking forward to it. Uh, will Nelson, I have a I have a hammer as a first first coral for a 10 gallon. Is this a good coral to start with and which other should I try? So a 10 gallon is a fairly small aquarium. Um, you'll want to make sure that you don't run into coral aggression issues with the hammer long term. So if you already kind of have like a, a large polyp stony coral like that, you might want to try uh, to, to find some other um, some other fairly easy large polyp stony corals to go with it. Uh, maybe uh, something that's like a, a meat coral, for example, maybe like a scoli or uh, some fungia plate corals that can just be put down on the substrate, things like that. Uh, I would probably avoid uh, some of the more delicate SPS and I would probably avoid some of like the larger soft corals like leathers and things of that sort that can kind of overcrowd or chemically combat um, the hammer coral that you currently have. She's trying to cover the statue itself to be reef safe. Oh. Yeah, that's that's a tough one, huh? Yeah, I, Harkins probably has some good suggestions on that front. He might have worked with with things like that before. I definitely haven't. So you know, I do have to. Okay, so Harkins said, I think Two Please is talking about c c covering the the statue to get stuff to encrust. I would go with a marine boat epoxy. Okay, so when it comes to to stuff that is marine. This is where you, you might have to do some research on, on exactly what kind of coatings you want to use. So I've come to realize that a lot of stuff that is made for marine, like, um, like certain types of, of stainless steel, certain types of coatings, they are, and certain types of like metal outside of stainless, like, like bronze, for example. They're good for marine applications, but they're not good for our fish tanks. The thing that makes them really good at being um, good for marine applications is that they don't corrode or they have some natural thing about them that inhibits um, invertebrates from growing on them, invertebrates and algae from growing on them. So 
the thing about like like bronze, you know, imagine those old school diver helmets. Uh, the reason why those are made out of bronze is because for long term use underwater, they inhibit the growth of like barnacles and stuff like that because they're essentially copper. And like 316 stainless has quite a bit of copper in it. Uh, so even though it has like some uh, some rust prevention elements to it, so it's very, very corrosion resistant, the real benefit is that it kind of kills off stuff. So when it comes to marine coatings, um, yeah, the it, it'll hold up, but you'd also want to not kill your stuff. Something to look out for. Uh, uh, Jarrell Harris, if I buy from you, do I still have to quarantine since you take such good care of your frags? Uh, well, thank you for saying that. Um, I would always recommend people dip in quarantine if you have the ability to do so. Uh, nobody has like 100% success rates as far as like pest control. Um, aquacultured corals naturally, uh, just because of, of, of how much inspection goes into each piece, tends to have fewer pests, but in large systems at scale, I think it's really naive to think that we don't have pests. And I'm not saying that you're naive. I'm saying like, if I said that we don't have pests, that would be, uh, first off, blatantly untrue. But even if I believed it, it is just naive. Like any large scale system is going to have pests. Like they are, if they were easy to take care of and easy to remove, uh, they wouldn't be called pests. They would just be some total afterthought that just died off on its own. No, it's they are they are very 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 good at surviving anything that uh, a, a store would throw at them. So definitely, like when you bring stuff in, no matter who it comes from, I don't care if they have the most sparkling reputation. You need to take care of yourself. So the dipping and the quarantine and all that stuff really is a layer of protection that that you want to take advantage of at home. <clears throat> Yeah, so Harkins and Deacanthus Reef, yeah, are backing me up on, on a lot of that stuff having copper. KC Reeves, yo, what's up, brother? Uh, am I going to see you again at, at Aquashella? Unfortunately, you will not see me at the Chicago show coming up. Um, as far as my travel goes, I think this trip to the UK might be the only one for the rest of the year. Next year, you might see me um, at a couple more shows. We'll see. Yeah, unfortunately, um, I think stuff is just going to start getting running right around the time that Aquashella, uh Chicago is going, because I think that's coming up, I think, like next week, right? Yeah. Yeah, so Aquashella. Aquashella, Chicago is next week, 27th, 28th, 29th. And that's when a lot of stuff is going to be happening here. So unfortunately, I won't be there. Uh, Gabe's Reef Tampa, do you consider algae a pest? Uh, yeah, I guess. I mean, it, it, it's all a... Uh, so... There are definitely some algae, some like leafy algaes, like macro algae that can definitely um, take over a tank. Uh, I don't like coralline algae. Like I think that coralline algae is one of those things that's like it's the lesser of two evils. It's it could be a really problematic algae or a slightly problematic algae that kind of looks pretty. Uh, I absolutely think that coralline algae is a problematic, like a mildly problematic algae that we put up with. But you're gonna get algae. There's, I mean, it 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 exists at such a microscopic level. Like, you're gonna get all kinds of algae. Intro to reefing asks: Are favias known for changing colors? Yes. I got a baby's breath from you, and it changed from gray blue to a bright cyan color. I really like how it looks, but I was wondering if that's common. Yeah, favias, favites, um, a lot of a lot of uh, large polyp stony corals that kind of have that brain coral esque shape. Uh, they can change color quite dramatically, especially if you're changing uh, lighting regimen. So. We do a lot of T5 here currently. In the future, we're going to be doing a lot of LED. Changing that that technology is going to be a big deal. 
Uh, water chemistry has a big deal to do with it. Feeding has a big deal to do with it. Uh, and here's the thing. You, it might turn into a color that you really like. Sometimes the challenge is even just keeping that color that you really like. Sometimes they, they're, they're going to continue to change. Uh, Dwayne Clark, how do I schedule delivery if not next week? Uh, you can just send us an email, uh, reference the the order numbers, and we'll we'll get we'll get it onto the shipping calendar where when you need it. Take your talk. What is going on? Welcome. Take your talk is my friend in town here. Uh, his channel, by the way, guys, is blowing up. So. Now's the time to get on that on that bandwagon if you want to, to say that you're an, an early an, an early subscriber. He does a lot of camera uh, reviews and things like that. Um, well, he wants to do other technology, but YouTube has pretty much dictated you're a camera channel. So the majority of his content that does really well is all camera based, and uh, yeah, he is going to get up to a million subs, no question. No question. Like he basically started last year and he has almost as many subscribers as I do now. And I've been at this for like 10 years. Uh, KC Reefs. All right, man. It was awesome meeting you in Dallas. Hopefully you can meet up in Dallas again and hit me up on IG. Yeah, uh, it's nice to meet everybody at, at, these, at these trade shows. But uh, I don't travel to them nearly as much as other people though. Like... A, a lot of uh, like social media influencers and YouTubers and stuff hit up like every single show they can. I'm like I'm good for maybe two a year. So yeah, hopefully we'll we'll uh, we'll see each other at at one of these shows. I don't know. I mean, I missed. I didn't even go to Macna. I've never been to a Reefa Palooza. So I, I I think I would like to at least try to go to one Reefa Palooza just to see just to see what it, what it's like in person. All this talk about polymers and resins. Uh, product Design Club, you do great work. Thank you. Thanks for sharing your knowledge. I appreciate it. Thanks for coming. Marina McKinley, Coraline that gets into my pumps and stuff is the worst. Yeah, the nice thing about Coraline is that it's very easy to remove. You can uh, soak your your pumps and things like that in vinegar or even just like plug them in and run them in a, in a bucket of vinegar. Uh, here we're a little bit more aggressive. We use muriatic acid. Don't know exactly what concentration we're currently using, but it's uh, it's a it's an unsafe yet time saving measure because it's much more aggressive. Oh, let's see. Uh, Chris, uh, I'm gonna totally butcher your last name. Chris W. Can you pick up locally? Yes, you can. Uh, just once you're done shopping, go ahead and send us an email and we'll, we will figure out a time and date for your pickup. Alfredo says, I started my channel focused on Lake Tanganyika and YouTube hates that I changed it to reefs. Yes. So uh, I've been friends with, uh, with Matt from Jayo Nation for a while and he's got this travel channel where he's uh, on a trike, he's triking around the world, but his his channel is very much, um, it's kind of a variety show, because he talks about hostels, not like hostile people, but hostel as in like places that you can stay when you're traveling. He talks about travel, he talks about his family, he talks about triking, and he talks about reef aquariums. Well, his channel started out talking about reef aquariums, and I think ever since, YouTube has it in its head, that his channel is really a reef aquarium channel, despite the fact that 90% of it now is travel related. So it's funny because every single time that he even mentions reef aquarium stuff now, uh, that video blows up. It has like 30,000 views and the rest of his stuff has like 4,000 views. And he was over here uh, in July for the Tidal Gardens barbecue. And I was telling him, it's like, dude, your problem is exactly this. It's like the artificial intelligence behind YouTube's algorithm has pretty much decided you're a reef aquarium channel that happens to do all this travel stuff and you're being punished for all this travel stuff and all this family stuff. 
And so he took like a super long break. And I think that he's uh, going to be segmenting out his stuff. So, um, yeah, so so Alfredo, yeah, your Lake Tanganyika stuff, that might be your YouTube channel. And you might, especially if you're currently small, you might want to start up a completely separate coral reef thing. Because if, if they have it in their head that you're a freshwater channel, that's where you're just going to be. Like, if I, if I do any content that is not specifically coral, it's severely punished. Like, I did a video where I was, like, diving with sharks. It's going to get fewer views than this live show, which live shows tend to get fewer views than regular videos. I think it might have, like, three, 4,000 views. Um, if I talk about cameras, I did, uh, I did that like maybe like a month or two ago. I knew that one's not going to, not going to do well. Uh, but it's very specific, like corals and reef related, reef aquarium related stuff. Harkin says, I use citric acid going back to cleaning, uh, coralline algae off of pumps and things like that. Uh, citric acid is good and safer. I just think that the cost of citric acid is high compared to muriatic acid. I think the cost of muriatic acid compared to everything, it's a lot cheaper. Especially like even vinegar. It's way cheaper than vinegar. Jake George, thank you very much for these live streams, Stan. You're welcome. Learning a lot as a new hobbyist. Getting extremely low nitrate levels now with my new tank. Good. You um, don't want super, you don't want like zero, but like low right around like five to ten is like that's where to be i have no idea what my nitrate levels are i'm i'm like this for me is like under 50. <laughs> please uh let's see dylan six what do you recommend to, to eliminate a tank full of hair algae so if i had a tank right now that had a ton of hair algae first and foremost I have to recognize that it is a nutrient issue at its root, okay? That there is this entire surplus of nutrient and it's both probably on the input side as well as not enough export. So might, I, I don't like to chill out on feeding and stuff because I like to feed a lot and I think that feeding is super important. But your export mechanisms might not be up to snuff. So you might want to consider doing more things like water changes. Think about upgrading skimmers, things like that. I don't super like um, directly attacking phosphate. So for example, I'm not really a huge fan of GFO and, and, and things of that sort. Those can help you though. Something to consider, not my favorite thing. I would rather up uh, skimmer capacity uh, and do more water changes. But if your tank is full of hair algae right this second, um, I'm definitely going to be in there with a toothbrush and a siphon. So every like drop of water change water should be full of hair algae from me and elbow grease. That's probably how I would handle that. And you do that until the, the job's done, which could be a while. George M. Hey, Than, how's your day going? It's going pretty good, all things considered. You know, hey, well, I, I can't complain about much. However, my college football team is getting currently blown out as we speak. Uh, I don't know what the score is. Don't even tell me the score. They're losing by a lot, I'm guessing. And I also cut myself shaving for the first, see this? First time in 10 years I cut myself shaving, right before the show. And I'm like, I'm bleeding all over the place. This is great. Otherwise, it's wonderful. Uh, what's totally random is that YouTube promotes me massively in India. 70% of my viewers are from India. <laughs> uh, Tech Gear Talk has that same sort of thing going on. A lot of his, a lot of his viewership is from India. Really weird. About like less than one percent of my viewership is Indian. Um, most of mine is from the U.S. It's really weird how how the algorithm shakes out like that. Casey Vagna, I'm late. What I miss? Start over. You can go ahead and scrub the entire timeline back. But uh, yeah, no, so we, I was complaining about um, the progress on my building. I was complaining about uh, wonky contractors that I might have to sue. Uh, talked a little bit about football. Talked a little bit about the YouTube algorithm, stuff like that. <sighs> Dwayne Clark, boom, order placed. Enjoyed it very much, now I can relax. We're only on item number 61. There's 120 more of these. 
let's see ryan draper when is your new shop going to be up and running that's a great question ryan i wish i had an answer for you my uh my 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 genius plumber and I, i'm not being like facetious he's amazing uh i have no idea when i'm gonna see him next i am hoping that he's gonna be here next week sometime to drop off plumbing materials and then start plumbing next week saturday that is like the perfect ideal situation uh those never actually happen those perfect ideal situations never actually happen and i just hope to see him period because i don't think i've seen him in months last time i saw him was like just after the the barbecue so that would have been like late july july august september so you had two months i haven't seen him in two months yeah so once i have like those first oh the other thing is we're looking at November to get the rest of the aquariums. But I, I would be okay with just getting the first four aquariums that we have here plumbed. Like that to me is a victory. I'm not even worried so much about this November stuff. Like that happens or not, doesn't happen. That'll, whatever. But just to get started on this stuff for um, this upcoming week would be huge. I mean, I would essentially like nearly double my current operation just with these four aquariums downstairs. And I desperately want to get that up and running because we're, I mean, it's been two years since we've started this, this building and uh, there's no, well, there's no like aquariums downstairs generating money, I should say. We're using the building for a lot of other stuff. So it's, it's nice for that. Uh, I'm using the studio right now, for example, but uh, it's not, it's not the same as having double your production capacity, right? It's not even close. How can I keep sponges from growing on my zoas? That's an interesting question. Um, sponges, you must have a very virulent type of sponge to have that happen. In the past, what I've had to do was to just physically cut them out. So when I propagate uh, zoanthids, I kind of make an effort to, to scrape away the, uh, the sponges, but it's very, very uncommon. Super uncommon. Uh, Suv Porridge. Hello, I'm new here. What are you talking about? Just curious. Well, the uh, the main gist of the live show is about coral, but we get sidetracked a lot. So I'd say about 50-50. It's coral and it's just other topics. So, okay, so Diacanthus is actually giving some interesting advice. If the rock is removable, lifting the rock out of the water for a few minutes may kill off the sponges. You can also use some tweezers to pick what sponge you can off. So what's funny about sponges, okay, is that they are supposedly um, like very delicate on the inside. So when you remove them out of the water, uh, they kind of like die from the inside out. And I have, I've got this like Cheshire cat grin going on because this does not work on, on sponges you actually want to kill. <laughs> I've like, there are some like brown gross sponges and there's, there's also like super bright pretty ones. It'll probably kill the super bright pretty ones, but like the really gross brown ones that can grow over top of corals and kill them, practically nothing kills those short of like a toothbrush and patience just sitting there grinding them away because yeah just 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 lifting it out of the water definitely does not kill them running them under fresh water definitely didn't kill them so theoretically correct though oh take your talk i get seven percent from indian of for some reason uh, i thought i thought it's much more than much more than that Hi, Than, do you do any kind of dosing on any of your systems? Uh, yes. It was kind of not ideal, but we do dose um, alkalinity. We use ESV for the alkalinity supplementation. It's their Bionic product, and we just get the alkalinity portion, not the calcium portion. Uh, we had a, so I mentioned just in passing, some of my Montipora were unhappy. I had another alkalinity drop in my systems. 
And part of it is because I'm having a really hard time getting people to get me a quote on large quantities of calcium reactor media. Okay. I've been calling around asking here and there because I need like a lot of it. I've got five calcium reactors next door. I'm going to have more and bigger calcium reactors here. I want to basically buy almost a pallet quantity, okay? And um, yeah, just whoever I'm talking to, multiple people, they're, they're just dragging their feet forever about getting me a quote on this stuff. So what's happening the entire time is my calcium reactors are blowing through the media. And it finally got to the point where one of my calcium reactors probably is down to like 2% left. And, but what's happening is like, we we're using a lot of carbon dioxide. So since it's not reacting with anything in the, in the reactor itself, what's happening? It's just lowering the pH of my whole system. So the, the entire thousand gallon system went from what's usually 8.3 down to 7.4 pH, which is unheard of, okay? In like a home basement system where you don't have any air exchange, that's one thing. But my tanks are basically outdoors. They are in a greenhouse with giant vents and fans blowing across. So under no circumstances should it ever be that low. It should always be rock solid 8.3. But essentially I'm causing a uh, an acid water bath situation because of my, my uh, CO2 injection. So anyway, I spent like yesterday uh, just getting a whole bunch of like coral skeletons and throwing it onto the, that calcium reactor. Uh, okay, I, I missed the Michigan thing. Michigan is getting slaughtered by Wisconsin. Yeah, they are. Uh, Macy's Daddy, do you have a target uh, PO4 for mixed reefs? I have an acro only at 0 0.02 and LPS at 0.1. They look great, but my mixed reef tanks seem to do best at 0 0.05. I don't stress about, um, about phosphate at all unless I have like a serious algae issue. We've had um, phosphate level readings of one part per million without, a cal without an algae issue. So do I recommend keeping phosphate at that level? Absolutely not. But I wouldn't stress out about levels at like 0 0.0 anything. Like, I, I would more worry about it being 0 than 0 0.1, like your LPS is at currently. Um, the, the tanks and the corals, they need phosphate. So I would rather have too much phosphate that's not at a dangerous level than having 0 phosphate, if that helps. Uh, I missed a comment about spaghetti worms. One sec. Uh, Marina McKinley, I missed my spaghetti worm. I got scared and bear dipped and killed it. They aren't really that bad. Uh, I don't know if you were responding to somebody earlier. Um, I tend to think that spaghetti worms are a liability. I think that especially they, they really like to grow, to to kind of root right around other corals, and I have noticed that some corals don't like it when they're around. So I kind of try to to remove them when possible. If anybody, by the way, I should just like create an item on my website that's like spaghetti worms for people's refugiums and stuff like that. If they, if people want them. I mean, they, they do absolutely do like cleanup crew type stuff. I just think that when they get around corals, they're not so good. We have an infinite supply of them. Uh, let's see. How much you need? I heard you can buy a pallet loose from Caribsy for like 1K. Yeah. I mean, I could use a lot. See, and the other thing that, that people... Um, that people don't get back to me on is not only the price of the carob sea stuff but it's like how much is even on a pallet i have no idea like so i like i'm hemming and hawing because like for one thousand dollars like i how much how much is on the pallet like i just i just i'm assuming i just need a lot of it i can buy it in, in bulk right so anyway uh, Ernie Wallace, two dollars. Thank you, man. I appreciate it. Greetings, Than. Greetings, greetings, greetings to everybody. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, Javi or Javi. Uh, first time viewing. First 
Reef tank ordered. Reef rock is curing. Thanks for sharing your knowledge. You're welcome. Yeah, I try my best here. Like, I think that um, with the amount of information that's out there now, it's this is like the, the best time ever to start getting into the hobby. Because, you know, back when I started, like, Google wasn't even invented yet. And if you just had questions, sometimes you just had to be real okay with just being confused. Like, that's just how it is. It's like, uh, there's just no answers for you. Sorry, bud. <laughs> but now there's like plenty of, of ways to get information. And there's ways to uh, to vet how good the information is and, and how good the provider of that information is. So like people, they show their tanks. And if they don't show their tanks, it raises red flags, right? So it's this, this is like the golden age. James Stallons, my tank is 0.23 phosphate, but everything looks fine and not much algae growth. Yeah, it's fine, right? Like no, no need to like stress out about it, rush off and, and go get like a GFO reactor or something like that going on. And all of a sudden you might just like strip out all kinds of nutrients that your, your corals were relying on. Not worth the risk. Um, Suv Porridge, is it a good idea to buy used live rock? I love it because unused is like four times more expensive. Um, I haven't shopped around for live rock recently. Once I get my show tanks up and running here, I'm probably going to be well acquainted with that reality. But um, I don't think there, there's a really a perfect rock out there. If, if I had to pick out an ideal rock, it would be real, actual live rock that came from the ocean long ago that uh, has been completely cured and preferably is actually completely dead rock. Like that would be my ideal stuff because there's a lot of other types of rock out there. And you know people, um, people have their favorites here and there, but like the real stuff that came from, from a reef is so different. It's so much lighter and more porous. There is a magic to that stuff. And other rocks, they're just, they're just not the same. So there's a couple of companies that are trying to recreate that synthetically without, you know, like digging up the reef. Uh, so I'm interested to, to try some of that stuff out, but uh, I, I haven't really made a decision one way or another on exactly what product I'll be using. But to answer your question, if it was used real live rock, it's like the best money can buy. Nice. So Jeff Jerry said, I bought a passion fruit. I'm guessing that's an Acropora from Tidal Gardens about a week ago, and it's one nice piece. Awesome. Glad you're happy with it. Uh, chop beef sandwich one. I have a spaghetti worm around my zoas. I've heard six lion uh, wrasses eat them, but mine doesn't. None of my wrasses eat them. Uh, none of my copper bands eat them. They don't seem to have like an active predator. Uh, you know what does kind of like kill them? It's like, it's like a two second dip in fresh water. That'll do it. But here's the thing, like you don't you don't have to euthanize these things if you don't want to. Like they are, I think they're perfect in like a in like a sand bed, um, in like a in a refugium or something like that. They like reach out and grab and eat a lot of uneaten foods, so they can do like a really good job. It's just when they're like on top of or right underneath my blastemusa or things like that, where things kind of get a little hairy. Go read a book is what my fish store told me when I started. I got like horrendously bad advice from different stores before. Like, well, I, and you know, cause it's a store is just basically like a couple of guys, right? So it's not like, oh, you know, my, 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 my store, as if they're really a reference. This is like a couple of guys, it could be anybody. And you know, one guy said, you don't have to feed coral. You just have light and that's good enough. kind of true but also kind of not because at the time that i heard that he was arguing with the customer that feeds corals he feeds his corals and was having a lot of success and he's trying to convince him to stop feeding corals 
another time, uh, a an LFS told me because I asked like, "What does a mandarin eat?" and the guy said, "Flakes." And I said, "Can you put some flakes in and show me?" And he wouldn't do it. <laughs> it's like stuff like that, you know. Like, come on. Uh, who are the rock suppliers? Uh, Greg Reef Boy is asking. So off the top of my head, a really popular one is um, Marco Rocks. Uh, one that synthetically makes it is Real Reef, I think. They make like this purple rock and they actually cure it in salt water and stuff like that, which is kind of interesting. Um, who else is out there, guys? Who am I forgetting? Like. Uh, I, I know that some other places might, st I don't know if any place actually has real actual live rock anymore. Uh, I think a lot of that stuff might have been banned a long time ago. Uh, cured pecani is incredible. Non-cured pecani is dirty baby diaper left on the side of the road, so cure it. Yeah, yeah anything that comes in, you have to cure, right? If, it's, if it was live rock, or live live. I'm talking about like dead rock, which is like bleach white looking. Walt Smith has like 50 tons of Pukani sitting in a warehouse and he just can't ship it out of Fiji. Yeah, I figure like a lot of that stuff is just, um, just, yeah, no bueno. What's your opinion on cleaner shrimp for reef tanks versus fish only with live rock? Is it a liability long term? Uh, yes and no. So I, I like cleaner shrimp, okay? Whenever my fish have ick, which is almost never, a cleaner shrimp takes care of it for me, right? I don't have fish disease issues. Problem is I have cleaner shrimp eating coral issues. And it's not that they really eat corals because they like eating corals. They eat corals because I feed corals and then the, the, the shrimp in its little shrimp brain is smart enough to figure out that if I pull open this coral and I can just eat all this other food. And they just do. And they eat so much. So yeah that is like the, the 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 downside to cleaner shrimp do i think you should avoid cleaner shrimp heck no they do a great job for what they do uh greg reef boy use marco rocks now and i have good results with it um good i i've used it before as well only place to know that that uh sells live actual live live rock is Tampa Bay saltwater uh, yeah I don't know if I want Caribbean stuff well do, okay first of all I don't want actual live rock <laughs> uh, that that's you know with full of life and, and algae and, and creepy crawlies because this is how you get mega pests you can throw that out there you're gonna find something that's gonna turn into like a blue crab one day Pristine rock, best dry rock on the planet. Tell John uh, to please send you. I have to, okay, guys, mark that down. Check out Pristine Rock. There's a free plug for them. <laughs> and again, uh, $4.99, I appreciate it too, please. Uh, I'll, I'll have to look at them because because I'm going to need so much rock in the future. But yeah, it's I need to, because like dry rock, it comes in so many... Um, so many tiers of, of, of quality, like I said, so. Hey, Than, I think channels like yours, this is, uh, this is Reef Jane, uh, are much better than many books. I started my first tank with you, BRS, Mr. Saltwater, and Coralfish 12G. Greetings from Switzerland. Oh, thank you. Yeah, there's definitely a lot more, uh, a lot more information. And so it's, I think it's a lot more dynamic these days as far as like, um, uh, as far as you're able to your ability to interact with people and also uh, just to just to see a lot of stuff because like the video format is just so different than reading a book right I mean I, I haven't bought a reef related book in easily 20 years I, I don't even know if like there have been many reef related books that have come out in the past like 10 15 years that are like must reads like I I, I haven't heard of it 
Gabe's Reef Tampa says, Pristine Rock is awesome. Just don't tell John that Gabe sent you. <laughs> All right, interesting. And Ernie Wallace with a quick $10. Coral's looking good as always. Demand, then. Man, fan. I can't talk now. I'm talking to myself. What do I even want to say? I don't even know. Thank you so much, though. <laughs> I just had a total schizophrenic episode just now. That was weird. Uh, what's your opinion on acclimating coral? I heard people are skipping the drip now, just matching temps. Do you still drip? Um, not so much with the drip, but then again, like we are pretty rough when it comes to our acclimation. Like we don't take more than 20 minutes. We just kind of uh, make sure to just to introduce it with some of the tank water, but we don't do the, 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 the drip stuff. More than anything, I just want to make sure that I don't ag aggressively dip it too much. That's as far as the acclimation component is really what I'm most worried about. Uh, like matching chemistry, matching uh, like temperatures, not the biggest deal for me. Uh, Sean Clark is asking, my large polyp blasto has a lot of new heads forming, but my hammer doesn't show any signs of new heads. Both have been in the tank for nine months, introduced at the same time. Am I doing it wrong? No. It depends on where you got your hammer from. If you got your hammer from, a, from an Aussie source, which is far more likely than any other place, um, it might be years before it grows a new head. They're very slow as far as like adding heads. Uh, but Blastamusa, they're, they're very fast at, at growing like buds. Now, budding hammers will grow heads a lot faster than, um, than the ones that do like the longitudinal fission type uh, of propagation. But yeah, it's, it, that's, you're not doing anything wrong, I don't think. Or if you are doing something wrong, it has nothing to do with your hammer not splitting. KP Aquatics, never heard of them, is my preference for maricultured Caribbean live rock. Still prefer getting maricultured into Australia overnighted, but that's kind of not a thing anymore. Yeah. How do you tend to sick rock flower anemones? One that is shrinking? Um, I'm not sure what the cause would be. That's kind of the thing. Uh, so... Hopefully it's not an aggression thing or it's not like sick, but if it's just shrinking, it might just need to be fed a lot. So maybe start feeding it a little bit every other day and slowly increasing the amount that you feed. A lot of times um, the reason why corals or anemones just aren't doing well is they're just not getting enough nutrient. I've been looking for fathead dendros, but not having any luck. Do you ever have those available? Uh, would you believe, Dwayne, I've never owned one. I've never ever had one. Casey says a lot of books are 10 to 20 years old, so YouTube is the best source for updates. Yeah, um, for sure. But at the same time, everything that was said 10, 20 years ago is still valid. Like uh, sometimes I run into a customer here, like a, a local, and They'll say like, you know, I, I was in the hobby 20 years ago. I'm just getting back into it and so much has changed. And I'm like, yeah, I guess. But literally everything that you used to do 20 years ago still works. Like everything still works. It's not like uh, we went from some kind of weird dark age where we were like using under gravel filters 30 years ago to figuring out protein skimmers. There hasn't been that leap in technology since then, I don't think. But I've been in it the entire time, so maybe I'm just like forgetting like all this stuff. Like, sure, there's LED, right? But until like very recently, I wouldn't have thought that LED was an improvement for like the health of the animals versus T5 or metal halide. Like, I don't think anybody would have like really thought that, right? But lately, there are some really good LED fixtures out there. I'm gonna give like Ecotech a free plug here, but like their their Radeon, like Gen 4 Radeon Pros are really, really, really good. Um, I haven't tried a lot of other fixtures out, but 
it's the first time where I was like looking at you know the results. I was over at Cherry Corals. I've been to some other places that use it. I know some individual hobbyists that use them, and it's like those are pretty good results. Like if 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 I just said, hey, you don't get to know what kind of lighting I'm using, but these are the results that you can get. I'd be like, yeah, that's a pretty good light. There, I don't see anything that's wrong. Um, for photography, not the best still. Uh, there's still room for improvement there, but it's not for photography. It's to keep your animals alive and colorful. So, you know, it's an excellent light. Um, but I'm trying to think of anything else that's happened recently, recent technology changes that are that much better. Um, are protein skimmers that much better? They're just different. I don't know if they're better. Um, DC pumps, that's kind of nice, but it's, I mean, they're, they're, they're moving the same water. It's just, more energy efficient. I mean, is it better than an Iwaki 100? Probably not. I don't know. Maybe maybe I'm just being like old school reefer guy. I don't know. Uh, James Stallings, any tips for getting Monty Cap off of the rock? Really want to move it uh, to the overflow or back glass. You're just gonna have to break it off. That's pretty much it. Uh, Casey is asking favorite dip. I use Coral Protect Pro. Really, it just says Protect. Okay. So it's I, it sounds it sounds very memey. Uh, like I protect, I attack. You know that that one. I uh, still got pests. So there's no such thing as a perfect coral dip. Uh, there's some that are better at certain things. There's certain pests that get past every dip. So unfortunately, uh, you know, find something that, that's not going to kill your coral and kind of like stick with that but you also have to do the if you wanted to be really safe you do the quarantine thing but again if you go back to my my video on that subject just setting it into a quarantine tank doesn't do anything it's the observation component that you have to be actively engaged in the quarantine process i guess haven't been able to find bear around here is it not in canada that i don't know that i don't know um the one thing I don't like about using Bayer Bug Killer is that it, it makes like a milky solution, and sometimes I like to to see into the solution. So I like a lot of the the more mild pine oil based guys, like the. I uh, we use a lot of um, what do you call it? Coral RX. What's the general conclusion when you get? Uh, a Duncan that closes up could be something about chemistry right could be chemistry it could be too much lighting it could be too much flow it could be a fish or a crab or something like that could be any number of reasons um, they're not super delicate but at the same time they're not like completely ridiculously bulletproof either Alfredo says, I follow the channel of a guy that's been reefing since the early 70s. It's like reefing from another planet. Yeah. Under gravel filters that are air driven are the real classics. Yeah. Or I like the ones that are like the reverse under gravel filter, <laughs> where you put a power head and you shoot it down into the thing. No, under gravel filters are hardcore trash. Like, I, I'm glad that that's not a thing anymore. Dosing pumps for calcium reactors are a huge step forward. So Mike, I don't know. I, I, I'm still on the fence about that. And the reason being, okay, uh, a lot of these dosing pumps aren't supposed to be running 24 seven like that. They're supposed to do like, like discrete doses and um, the just, just like that that uh, peristaltic am I even saying that right? I used to I used to say peristaltic, which I guess is incorrect. But then I look at how it's spelled. I think it's peristaltic. Anyway, that little bit of tubing wears out over time, and um, I know that like certain calcium reactors, uh, like the, the like the Destaco and stuff like that, that's on a controller, so it's not just running all the time. So that's kind of like a worry that I have is that um, it's like the longevity of like the little discrete parts of a dosing pump. And also that, that the, the head 
part of that pump that's that's rotating has like a, a much shorter lifespan than just a centrifugal pump does. So yeah, I'm totally like pumping my brakes on that. And by the way, guys, this is one reason why I don't do a lot of um, equipment reviews or anything like that. It's because I am a very late adopter these days because the, the systems that I run, if I do something and and I'm just trying to experiment, try to like mess around and something gets screwed up, it's it goes really bad. It's, it's never worth the curiosity, right? So whenever there's this, oh, the latest and greatest such and such, I... I, I hesitate to just jump in. You know, I want to make sure it's working in everybody else's tank first. I want to make sure that the company that makes that is not total garbage. Hate to say it, but uh, on the industry side of things, like flip a coin, you don't want to be doing business with half of them. Like that's just how it is. So I have to. I, I try to vet as much as possible the company behind the product now also. It's not good enough just to have a halfway decent product. You need to be a non-garbage level company. And that's, that, that, that'll be my hot take for this week, okay? It's like as, as in, in a professional environment, you can tell some of these places are just, they literally started up in their garage and never really left their garage mindset wise to like, you just can't work with some people. So yeah, I, I try to like do as much research as I can, make sure that people are going to be around, how, how easy or difficult it is to get servicing done, all that stuff. So like, I'll give you a perfect example, okay? Um, Sony versus Canon cameras. So Sony is like an electronics company. They're very general. They come out with, with really high spec cameras all, all the time. They make a good product. Canon is slower production cycle. Kind of don't care what their customers like as far as design choices. They're not spec monsters, okay? But what they put out is made to work period end of story it is definitely for like a filmmaker's environment or a professional photographer's environment okay when your camera if something happens and you need to contact professional support at Canon okay they understand the business that you're in that every second that that camera is not on set is costing a production a lot of money they understand that so their turnaround is unbelievable so Sony might like yank you around and just drag their feet and just be a pain to work with because they make so many other products like TVs and like dishwashers I don't know Sony makes so much stuff right but they they're not like a camera company at its core whereas Canon not messing around they will turn around your repair so fast. It's like, I don't even know how this arrived to you that fast, and I don't know how it's back here that fast. But here it is, and it is fixed. And it's free. Like, Canon service, right? This industry ain't like that. Some some people are. Like, if I, if I had to, to, to say um, my best uh, experiences as far as like customer support goes, it's like places like Ecotech. Ecotech is like outstanding. So anyway, uh, that was my little rant about that. And I'm not going to throw any particular company under the bus right now, but half of them, easily half. You pronounced peristaltic correctly, maybe. <laughs> well, that's also a coin flip, right, Amy? <laughs> maybe it's peristaltic, maybe it's peristaltic. Staltic. Uh, let's see. Alfredo said, I recently installed a calcium reactor, and no matter the effluent rate, the KH in the tank stays stable. I don't get it. Well, the KH in the tank should stay stable. That's kind of like what a calcium reactor does. It provides you baseline stability. It's not about raising or lowering stuff. It really shouldn't do that. Uh, if, if a calcium reactor is doing its job, everything just stays rock solid. Continuous duty peristaltic, you said it right. Pumps, not to be confused with just dosing heads are my preference for sure. Have you, I used to have used a master flex, which was loud, but it worked great. Interesting, okay. 
Tanks 4D memories. I loved undergrad gravel filters for fish only tanks. Did you used to manufacture them or something? I don't know anybody that used to like under gravel filters. Uh, let's see. If you had years of success uh, using T5s, then why would you go to LED? Okay, so Gabe's Reef Tampa. I'm assuming you're addressing me. I didn't know if, the, if somebody else had something to, to ask about that. So the reason why I'm going with LED downstairs in this building, okay, is in the greenhouse, uh, the heat that T5s generate, it's not a big deal because uh, the, the tons of air movement, it's, it's a constant process anyway for temperature control out there. In this building though, uh, it is so well insulated that all the heat that you generated stays here. So this place with just the LEDs that we have currently downstairs, which is uh, less than half the building, but I think it's like 72 fixtures for less than half the building. And the, the heat that just those lights can generate will get this place cooking hot that then I have to deal with. If I had T5 downstairs instead of LED, that heat might be double. And that's just not something I want to deal with. I don't want to run like air conditioning longer than I need to. I don't want to, I mean like the, the size of air conditioning units that we're already getting are pretty extreme. Um, yeah, I, don't, I just don't want to go down that path. So if we do have any T5 downstairs, it's gonna be in very limited quantities. And I don't even know if it's so much electrical cost. Like, I, I don't know if I'm saving very much in electricity with, uh, with, well, I mean, I probably am, but I'm not sure how much really I'm gonna be saving with radions because each radion unit is up to 200 watts. And again, 200 watts, uh, 72 fixtures. It's probably gonna be close to like 150 when I'm done. Uh, not really saving a ton. It's just the heat. The heat is like legit. Greg Reefboy, Than, what do you think about getting a bad batch of salt? Has it ever happened to you and how to correct it in a timely manner? Uh, knock on wood. I don't think I've ever had a bad batch of salt. Um, it could certainly happen. I've, cer I've heard of bad batches of salt coming from the place that I get my salt. It's just that, uh, no, I, I really haven't messed with it too much. And, you know, I order, I order stuff by the pallet load here. So I have like several pallets and, um, yeah, it's tough. Like, I don't even know how you'd go about dealing with that, except just to immediately run out and just start getting different salt. I would even hesitate to going away from the current brand that you're dealing with because the, the stress of, of changing uh, brand formulations is kind of like total nonsense. But, I mean, I wouldn't even know a good way for me to detect a bad batch of salt. We don't do enough testing here to really tell. Um, yeah, that would really stink if that happened. Because we, we, make, we make salt a thousand gallons at a time. That means I now need to make up another thousand. I've, uh, so Scott Smith says, I've heard the opposite from a lot of people. Um, I've never dealt with Ecotech, but if you read reviews, a lot of people disagree. You know, people might have, there's bad reviews of me. So, hey, so sometimes totally warranted. Like, th there, there could have been a situation where, like, I just refuse service to somebody and they're mad about it. It could totally happen. Um, but my experience with Ecotech has been nothing short of spectacular. Like, they've been very good to me. So I will always have nice things to say about them. But I do, I mean, I, I know what you mean. So there's a, a store, I'm not gonna mention the store, okay? And I always have a good interaction with the, with the owner. And I say, you know, like, yeah, so-and-so's a nice guy, and you know, the, he, he, he runs a nice shop. 
and the, 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 the customer that I'm recommending uh, this other store to will be like, don't like that guy. Every single time I walk in there, never gives me service. That guy acts like he hates his life and never wants to like help out a customer. Like not, not help out as in like give a good deal. Like not even like acknowledge that person's existence. Like actual bad customer service. So I'm like, huh. Okay. But, you know, maybe I'm getting better treatment because title gardens is more of a an established thing rather than somebody walking in off the street. I don't know. But I have had good experiences, got to say. And I have had bad experiences with other people. So it's not like across the board. Of course, everyone's going to take care of you. And your title gardens. No, dude. Did you hear my septic tank story? No. <laughs> You no, know, there there are plenty of companies in this industry. They suck. They suck. Uh, let's see. Uh, Jose, will you ever do eBay auctions like WWC, World Worldwide Forum? Um, we used to do eBay like 15 years ago. Um, I don't like eBay as a platform. So maybe it's changed, but the, there's a point when we were doing eBay auctions where eBay would basically be taking half the money. So one thing that would happen is that they so so for first of all they take a percentage of sales right obviously but then they wanted to compete with amazon on shipping so amazon for prime members there's a lot of free shipping a lot of free two-day stuff so what in ebay's genius mba mindset thought you know what we should do we should push this cost onto the sellers so what they did is if you say if you put like a shipping cost for your item eBay will take 10% of the shipping price. So for places that have to ship overnight, so let's say I charge, let's say $40 for shipping. That means I now have to pay $4 of that, which by the way, at $40, you're already taking a loss on shipping. Um, now, now I have to take an additional $4 loss just to, uh, just to eBay. And then on the transaction side, of paying with PayPal, I lose another 3% or something like that on PayPal. So when you like put it all together, uh, you end up like a huge amount of that sale went to eBay. Now, that's okay if eBay is holding up their end of the bargain, which why are you even on eBay, right? Your eBay is supposed to bring a lot of people bidding on your stuff. There were auctions which, no joke, had 13 views in, in seven days. So that is a very steep price to pay for 13 views on an auction. So after that, I'm like, nope. So I was making, let's say, I mean, this was like a long time ago, so the, mon so the dollar values of everything was like less. But I was probably making like five figures a year on eBay auctions. And I'm like, none of that is worth it. So I, I was like, I, I will forego like tens of thousands of dollars to not have to do eBay again and just like focus my attention elsewhere. So unless somehow eBay is wi a wildly different place, which somehow I doubt, um, it ain't happening. Not happening. Ken Selleck, how do you mix a thousand gallons of salt? Uh, check out my last video where I did a, a building update. I've got uh, several, oh, not several, I have two 1,000 gallon containers. Scotch is very consistent over the years. That's very true. So I missed the first part about that, but yes, I, I know that like the uh, a lot of like uh, alcoholic beverage manufacturers go back and like homogenize past years with their current stuff to keep it baseline. 
Ecotech spell check to scotch. <laughs> Funny. So yeah, I, sh I should have read a few lines down. Funny, funny. Uh, Tattoo Dancer 91. If I were to start fragging for a hobby sized profit, what corals would you recommend? Specific types like Zoas, beginner corals, high end sticks? Um, long story short, I would go for what is hot right now. Um, the problem with that is by the time that you actually have a stock going, it might be not as like the price point might not be as attractive so what's hot right now right let's say uh really colorful bubble tip anemones are, are really hot right now some of them are selling for like a thousand dollars wholesale by the time that you acquire one of these things and are able to propagate it into like a number of pieces to then resell without hurting your ability to, to, to produce more. The price of that, that was what, let's say it cost you $1,000 to get some like, you know, crazy color morph. Um, what if the price has now dipped down to $200 retail? So now you have to sell five just to recoup your initial cost of just the animal. That's kind of like the, the problem that you run into when you're trying to like chase like the, 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 the hottest named stuff. But at the same time, uh, if you're selling like the most common stuff, you know you, you might be able to sell it more easily just because it's going to be at a lower price point and it's going to be less um, less price fluctuation. Like Xenia is going to be about twenty something bucks to thirty bucks. It'll be in that ballpark. Uh, I'm talking nationwide. Some people you you might be living in a pocket where Xenia is free. It's a weed. Um, other other places wholesalers will buy Xenia from you so it's like the, the the demand for stuff has like a geographical component too but generally speaking the the, the staple stuff is going to be more uh, uh, like baseline sustainable and and less trendy but it's uh, lower risk lower reward I guess Uh, Corey Rittenauer, what do you use for frag plug glue? Still dollar store? Yes, we just got like cases and cases and cases from there. Um, so we did some quick math because I was thinking, uh, going back to, to Ecotech uh, or Scotch, uh, somebody was saying you should just get like the like the, the big volume thing of super glue from like, you know, better sources than a dollar store. And we did the math on it. Uh, it's like double the price, even at the using like the the big volume stuff. I didn't believe it because I was thinking like how I've I've been told multiple times that that is cheaper than the individual little tiny you know, glue stick things that that I get. But it was like double, so we went right back to dollar store. Uh, let's see, Marina uh, McKinley. I got a Pacific Green anemone from you a few weeks back. It's doing really well, but what is it exactly? I can't find any anything about non-Caribbean rock flowers. Okay, um, it is a. It, I think it's either a rock anemone or a flower anemone. Oh shoot! It's a. Shoot! Let me just do the search now. It's something Crispa. I think the 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 species name is Crispa. Uh, Pacific oh, and of course I'm like finding <laughs> I'm finding my myself very helpful I used to know the species of this. No, you're not you're not joking. It's 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 really not out there, huh? Oh. 
Uh, Phymanthus? Genus? Uh, yeah, so, so check out... Uh, uh, so the species name is Crucifer. C-R-U-C-I-F-E-R. Um, I don't know if this is the right genus, but that, that Crucifer does sound familiar. Yeah, phy Phymanthus. Here, let me... Uh, so this, yes, you can check that out. Wow, we're already at item number 148. So we're, this, we're going to 181, and uh, we're gonna be capping it off with like a really expensive elegance. So one of those gold tip guys. I think it's like we put it up for like $900 or something like that. Um, hopefully somebody does pick it up on the live show, but if somebody doesn't, I'm pretty sure somebody within not that long is gonna pick it up for more than 900 on, once it hits the website. Yeah, so our our Montes, um, yeah, K Casey was saying like, ooh, that Superman. Um, they are in the process of bouncing back because we we had a a little pH mess up because of a calcium reactor. I, I think like the the calcium reactors not being serviced enough here leads to most of my chemistry issues. It's like, oh, why why is our stuff looking goofy? Oh, it's because we ran out of CO2 and we don't know how long that's been. Or the calcium reactor has been empty for three months. How long has that been a thing, right? Three months. So yeah, this last time we had a pH dip, which is unheard of here. And oh, hopefully we, we've got all that resolved. Neil Pelling, what, what could be causing tin levels to rise when all equipment is clean with no corrosion? You know, that's a good question. I'm not really sure. Um, you know, I think that, that once we've started to now do like, not we, meaning like me, because I've never done it before, but now that like the, the aquarium community has some access to ICP testing and stuff like that, I think that we need to get better educated as to what ICP tests are and how to not slavishly freak out about values that you receive from them. So where am I going with that? Um, oh, back when I had an office job, when I was like doing business law stuff, I was working a lot with pharmaceutical chemists doing like drug development type work more obviously more on the legal business end of things patents and stuff like that but I learned quite a lot about drug development and characterization of organic molecules blah 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 and one of my close friends um, that I went to school with she is a pharmaceutical chemist that does exactly that kind of research so back when I was doing the office gig I talked to her a lot and uh, these machines that do uh, like all this, all this chemistry work on, on the samples that you send in are pretty miraculous, right? They, they are fantastic technology and they've been around for a really long time. Like, you know, like ICP testing and um, like NMR and all, all, like all, all the different types of characterization techniques that you can imagine. These technology, these these technologies, like tandem max mass spec, that that type of stuff has been around for a very long time, like since the '70s in some cases, maybe even longer. So this is not new technology. It's it's very old technology that's being applied for the first time to our reef aquariums. Um, but a lot of this work, or a lot of the accuracy of the results you get, 
has got a lot to do with the technician doing the test and has a lot to do with your handling of the specimen. So you could totally have screwed up your own specimen, sending it over there and getting weird results because you contaminated your sample. Uh, entirely possible that the person operating and doing the, the, the test screwed something up and you're getting improper results. So long story short, if you're, if you're seeing like trace readings of stuff that are looking wrong, don't freak out. It's a trace reading. It could have been anything. It could have been like you had too much oil on your finger and some of that got into the container, blah, blah, blah. Bad sample. It could be anything. Just like, like when it comes to like trace elements, I wouldn't even freak out. Anything that is not a major element, I'm not really too concerned about. But I think that like we, as like a community, sometimes overrate the latest and greatest things. So yeah, just don't freak out. I wouldn't go taking your whole tank apart looking for tin sources, in other words. Uh, AJ Gonzalez was asking, oh, by the way, two please, thanks again for the dollar ninety nine. smash some thumbs up. What are we doing in terms of the thumbs up? Like, I, I'm the last person in the world that, oh, my bad. What just happened there? Um, 53? Do we got 53? Not terrible, I guess. I like never ask for thumbs up. <laughs> so thank you too, please, for, for hitting them up for the thumbs up. Time for a trident on each system. You know, I would actually like to, to do, I, I would, if I had the, um, the money to burn, I would probably like to do a trident on each system and a mind stream on each system and maybe doing like a periodic test here and there manually. I, I, I'm like a, I, I really do like taking a look at the data and stuff like that. Um, but we don't test nearly as much as we do. But I do like continuous monitoring. I think that there is something to be said for uh, having all that data available on demand. It's very cool. Will Nelson, how do you buy these things, these corals? So uh, on screen right there, you can see if you want to buy corals, you head over to titlegardens.com. And on that page, you can find a link to this live sale. And you will see, for example, item number 160, which is a very frumpy looking zoanthid. And if you would like that item, you can just toss it into your shopping cart and check out like normal. There's also like an FAQ link on that page, and that covers like issues about shipping and how long the, the show goes for. So this show, um, the corals will stay available for 72 hours, give or take. It's usually a little bit longer. We usually start taking them down about Wednesday-ish. But that's, that's it in a nutshell. Go to titlegardens.com slash live. Harkins is using the Mindstream H2O and love it so far. Nice. Yeah, I, I would, I'd be up to, to trying any and all types of, of uh, continuous monitoring. So real quick, Harkins, is that, um, is that retail yet? Or is it still in beta? I'm not sure. I haven't looked into it. Uh, Ryan Draper is asking. Uh, so real quick, Ernie Wallace, thank you for the dollar ninety nine. Taking two pleases lead on that, huh? <laughs> um, appreciate it, man. I, thank you. Uh, Ryan Draper is asking, how do you tell the difference between zoas and pallies? It's confusing because of the internet. In practice, it is not confusing. But, and I'm guilty of this too. Somebody on Instagram had called me out, or didn't call me out, he just said uh, such and such that we had listed on Instagram as a pally is really a zoa. And he's right, it is a zoa. So why did we call it a pally? 
It's just because that's what the internet calls these things sometimes. That's really all it is. So most things that you think might be Zoas or Pallies are probably Zoas. Uh, the few things that are Pallies are things like Paleothoa grandis, are going to be like Purple Death, Nuclear Green. Uh, their polyp is very different looking. Their tentacles look different. They incorporate gravel into their, into their bodies, into the actual flesh, whereas zoanthids don't. Um, they have much more likelihood of actually having palytoxin. Zoas kind of get lumped in there. Some zoas do. Probably most of them don't. Things like that. But uh, like I think what throws people is that there are species of zoanthids like Zoanthus gigantea that are every bit as large if not larger than a paleothoa but when you see that um, like one of those so for example like an utter chaos right if you if, if you know what I'm talking about an utter chaos uh, pally or zoa they are zoanthids but they're four times larger than a um, a Fruit Loop or um, what do I think? Like um, same color as a Fruit Loop, but Rastas, right? Those guys are like super tiny. So there's like the you can just have this huge size variation. So what tends to happen is the the zoanthus that are larger get lumped in with pallies, if that makes sense. And it's just a, it is a reef aquarium thing only has nothing to do with biology or, or uh, taxonomy. It is just a convenience thing. So oftentimes like the pallies that you see on our website, the only reason that they're there is not because of scientific accuracy, it's because of Google search. We should fix that, <laughs> but we haven't done it yet. Oh, okay. So it is retail, says Robert Guerra. Mindstream went on sale at MACTA 2019. Very cool. Harkins had his for four months, tested every 15 minutes. All parameters are... Testing 15 minutes on all parameters is awesome. Currently active for sale at 1K each and 35 a month if you buy the whole year at... Uh, okay, so and there's a 35... And 35 a month if you buy the whole year at once. So, so the reagents for one is, or the, the, the disc I'm, I'm guessing is $35 a month. iPhones won't even do $2. That's why I'm a $1.99 king. <laughs> it's like, it's like, see, my, my, my supporters are cheaper than Bernie Sanders. There you go. Uh, can purchases be made on site and avoid shipping? So David Halterman, uh, so your best bet for the live show, anyways, and you, yes, if you, if you make a, an appointment or come visit, you can absolutely purchase on site. Uh, for the live show, if you see something you like, you might want to purchase it in advance just because there is kind of higher competition for these things. Having said that, we do have multiples of, of a lot of them, but if there's something in like very specific that you're looking for that we don't have multiples of, um, you might want to pull the trigger on that and just select uh, local pickup for the shipping option so you're not charged shipping. Yes, the disc is 35 a month. 35 a month is not bad. For, for the amount of testing that's being done, that is not bad. Um, hmm. The problem is the number of units that I would need. In total, I would need like, right now I have five systems running soon to be six systems running, later to have seven systems running. So that's $7,000, like assuming it's retail, right? It'll probably be a little bit less wholesale. Um, it'll cost me seven grand plus 35 a month times seven. How much is this information really worth to me, guys, right? Harkins is like, it's really cheap when you look at it. I'm looking at it. I don't know. That's a, that's a, lot, of, that's a lot of expense for, for, for the datas. But at the same time, it's like, well, 
what is the value of the coral sitting in the systems compared to $35 a month per system, right? But at the same time, I'm, I'm, I come from a land where we don't test a whole lot. But the, like hope-based strategies, it's like I hope that nothing goes wrong. That's never the right answer either. So we'll see. <laughs> Robert Gary, you can probably get them at wholesale. Well, I know I can get them at wholesale. But there's like wholesale and then there's like wholesale. And I want to be in that other category of wholesale. Uh, Torch MMA Empire is asking, any changes to your systems uh, since you visited Cherry Corals? No, nothing. Nothing really changed in my systems. Um, so the one thing that uh, that I did that I did like seeing at their system that I would probably incorporate into mine is um, a better quarantine thing. Like like quarantine, uh, I um, basically my entire greenhouse at this point is like a quarantine system, right? It's like the constant observation thing. And anytime, like, especially once we have aquariums in our new building here, everything has to go through the greenhouse first. Nothing is just going like, to come in and, and get into our systems at the, in this building. And if I ever do see any issues with anything that's in this new building, I'm going to kick it back out to the greenhouse for treatment, right? But I would really like to have a, a dedicated um, quarantine system that, is, that makes observation easy. Uh, so again, going back to uh, quarantine being an active process, having like a quarantine tank that's basically some like dungeon lit tank doesn't help me, right? So I want like to be able to very actively and very easily observe everything that is in quarantine. So if I see something bad, I can take care of it. Just having it sit there for a couple weeks doesn't do any good if I can't actually see what's going on, right? So anyway, that, that's one thing. The other thing that I liked was settling tanks. So uh, all the detritus that kind of gets stirred up in your main tank goes into your overflows, into a big settling tank before then overflowing again into your equipment sump. I did like that idea. Barrett Betty, hi Title Guards from Dubai. Awesome. I'd like to visit Dubai one day. I see a lot of air bubbles in your system. Are you facing algae or cyano issues? Would love to know how you're dealing with it. Uh, you're seeing a lot of bubbles mainly because uh, we are in, so that's in a greenhouse, okay? And especially in the summertime at this hour, you get a lot of oxygen bubbles uh, from, from just microalgae. Uh, just being in and around stuff. You just get a lot of, all, all of that's like oxygen bubbles, believe it or not. Also, some of these things were put in the tank recently and the mucus coats of, of going from like one type of water to another type of water will kind of like stress out a coral a little bit. And so their mucus coats will kind of attract like some, some bubbles that are, that are forming. So that, that's the story there. And we really don't have cyano issues. There's like a couple tanks here and there that have some cyano, but right now you'd be a little hard pressed to, to find a lot of cyano here. Uh, Casey, does coral have any of the pain in the butt shipping issues of other animals when shipping across the border? You can't do it. Like uh, coral is a very tightly regulated market. It's, it's done through CITES, which is an international treaty of trade of endangered species. So uh, basically, I need to have an export license. Uh, other person on the other side has to have an import license. Everything has to have CITES documentation and be inspected at a, at a Fish and Wildlife Office here. Um, that whole process is extremely expensive. And um, we don't really expect to do um, export in the future, but to put it really succinctly, we would start considering export more seriously once the individual transactions are over $30,000. Before that, we're probably not even going to consider it. So it's definitely not for like an individual hobbyist, unless that individual hobbyist has like 
a public aquarium size display that he needs to fill. By the way, this is that yellow tipped elegance that I was talking about. That's pretty sweet. This is under daylight lighting essentially. But as you can see, like as it goes more towards like the the uh, the bluer end of the spectrum, how you can, you can kind of see the fluorescence, but the actual tips are this cool like yellow slash orange color. And under like all LED, it gets like really, really, really crazy punchy. Pretty neat stuff. Harkin says, I like their quarantine carts. I did too. Uh, it's a little dark though. Like I, I would want like spotlights everywhere. They're not doing wholesale yet. Interesting. Trust me, I want to put them on most of my clients' tanks. Hmm. We're talking, that was about Mindstream, right? Jacob Stromberg, can you eat any of these? You can eat anything once. Uh, no, you should not be eating coral. They Definitely not, not, uh, not Zoas. So by the way, we're in overtime now. Uh, we're going all the way back to the beginning. So if you guys had missed a couple of the early corals, you guys get a little bit of a break or a little bit of a chance to see some of them. So eating something like this could kill you. Like the, these might have something called palytoxin. That would be very, very bad. So uh, by the way, I, that, that's a joke uh, about eating stuff. Cause I saw this, like this meme uh, on the internet about, uh, about mushrooms and it's like all mushrooms are edible once. <laughs> so I got a kick out of that. So, by the way, Casey, uh, CITES is for stony coral specifically. CITES does not apply to soft corals or zoanthids and stuff like that. But you still have to do all these other things. Like this was something that I um, that I talked about with um, one of my friends that does do quite a lot of import export, and she says that just because something doesn't need CITES doesn't mean it doesn't need everything else. Like there's like five other things that, that are not CITES that still need to happen. So it's not just like, oh yeah, I could just throw, throw it in the, you know, in an overnight container and send it to you because it's, it's not a stony coral for CITES. It doesn't work that way. There's still like health certs, all kinds of stuff. Harkins, I wanted to buy a hundred Mindstreams and they told me no. <laughs> Great. Are they a good company? Going back to my company rant. Are you allowed to buy discs rather than sign up for the monthly subscription? Not sure if there's any shelf life issues or not. Yeah, individual discs for $39.99. Hmm. But you need access to the data on the cloud server, so you have to sign up for the service. Huh. The Mindstream itself doesn't store data. Huh. People say that anemones are good to cook and eat. Around where I live, people like to catch and eat cannonball jellyfish. Uh, I cannot imagine an anemone being good to eat. But then again, people have some some interesting tastes out there that are some that people consider delicacies. But mm, yeah, dollar <laughs> ninety nine to the tea, please. Let's get that elegant sold. <laughs> Here's the thing. If somebody buys it on this live show, I, I'm telling you, they're going to save hundreds of dollars because I'm going to be putting it on the website. And this happens all the time. See, here's the thing. My live show audience, it's like I love you guys, right? But there is a, there is a, um, a price range that, that you guys are all about. Like once we get a little over like $100, it's like the, the, the interest for that item goes down. We just put that up because I think it's like super cool and I wanted to show it to you guys. But like the, the, the high roller crowd that's, that's into like the $2,000 Croc Island Scolies and stuff like that or into like the, the $1,000 plus Master Scolies, guys, for whatever reason, they don't like to watch these live shows or something, I don't know. But within like a couple days, they are more than willing to pay a premium to buy it off of my website rather than buying it off of this live show. But anyway, it's it's fine. It's fine. 
I have cyano issues. How would you recommend to deal with it? I'm doing every week a 10 gallon, a 10% water change. Also, do you think it has to do with light uh, programs? I'm using Radeon G4s. It's probably not your lighting. It's a, it's a chemistry thing. Um, cyano is kind of a nuisance, it, but it, it's, long story short, you doing those 10% water changes are going to are going to help you out a lot. I would try to re physically remove as much as you can, um, and just try to like stay on top of how clean the food that you're feeding is. Sometimes like really messy foods will just be naturally high in stuff like phosphates and things like that. That could be leading to your to your nutrient problem. But yeah, it's it's frustrating. Don't freak out about it. Just try to stay on top of it, and and your uh, your water changes should help. Um, if you really wanted to, also look into what your phosphates might be and consider GFO. I don't really like GFO a lot, but it does help with, with some of that stuff. I don't know. Someone had to be the first guy to eat a shrimp or an oyster. Maybe corals are delicious. See, the thing is, like, shrimp and oysters, you can almost say smell delicious, whereas, like, uh, anemones. I don't like, the, like I don't like the, how my hands smell after even touching one, so I can't imagine. <laughs> Marina McKinley. I wonder if anyone needs a kidney. I'm sure someone does. <laughs> I love that elegance. It, it is really cool. It is really cool. It's the first time I've seen them with that bright of tips. All right, guys. We went about 10 minutes into overtime here. I have a sore throat, so, and I'm also a little bit hungry, so I'm going to grab a bite to eat. Hopefully, uh, you guys enjoy the rest of your weekend. Hopefully, your football teams do better than my college football team did, and my pro football team will do tomorrow. So, anyways, uh, any last-minute thoughts, throw them in there. Anemone pasta. We will end it on anemone pasta. All right, guys. Uh, until next time, happy reefing and all. Uh, hopefully, I'll do. I'll get a um, a building update done when we get a little bit more done here. And I'm working on a couple of coral uh, species spotlights. So, anyways, hope you enjoyed the live show. Thanks for attending, and I'll see you guys 